In part one of this series, we talked about control points and interlockings, and you got to see how railroad passing sidings work. A siding is a place in the timetable and is intended for the meeting of trains, and usually the intermediate block signals are simply placed where normal spacing causes them to fall. Industrial tracks that exist only to serve rail customers generally don't get special signal treatment. A good example of that is the Yatesville siding which services the Valley Industrial Park. And of course, there may also be industrial tracks at the location of a siding, such as here at CP672. Signal bridges were typically used to mount signals on, near, or at the end of passing sidings or where more than two mainline tracks existed. Here at Milesburg, Pennsylvania, on the former PRR, XPC, XCR, Bald Eagle Branch, now the Nittany and Bald Eagle short line, one such rusty relic of the way railroading was still stands even though the classic position light signals went dark ages ago. Here at Mecklehatton, Pennsylvania, on the Buffalo line, the bridge still has operational position lights in the photo, though sadly the classic cat size were swapped out for the new Darth Vader types back in 2018. In fact, you might remember back in 2018 when I said this. On January 22, 2018, the 60-plus-year-old Pennsylvania Railroad position light signals went dark from Renovo to Driftwood, Pennsylvania, and signals were shut off and removed from service. Norfolk Southern removed signaling from Driftwood to Baker following FRA approval received in 2017. NS Communications and Signal Crews on January 22nd removed Driftwood, Keating, and Drury interlockings from service and went to a manual block limit system. This eliminated the Pennsylvania Railroad-style position light signals at all of these locations that had been placed in service when the LICO CTC project was done in 1967 and 68 and had lasted 50 years. This brings an end to all signaling on the Buffalo line from Lock Haven to Buffalo itself. With declining traffic and the high cost of maintaining signals for what averages one train a day on this section of the railroad, changes were inevitable. Local H57 makes two to three round trips per week from Lock Haven to Driftwood and currently NS is operating about one train a day to or from the interchange with RJ Corman as NS632 and NS633 trains that operate to and from Baltimore, Maryland with export coal. CP Keating was the busiest junction point on the Pennsylvania Railroad Buffalo line in later years as much of the coal traffic off of the Clearfield area lines of the Pennsylvania Railroad and New York Central was routed over the ex-New York Central WBV branch aka the River Line. The New York Central had trackage rights prior to the Penn Central merger for the movement of its trains between CP Rich at Mecklehatton to CP Keating which allowed the New York Central to avoid using its Beach Creek line and ultimately led to its abandonment. Norfolk Southern Communication and Signal Crews have been installing new safe trans signals between CP Norrie in Northumberland and CP North Ferry just above Clark's Ferry. The crews have been working south installing the new signals at each interlocking and intermediate point in preparation for the signal cut over this fall. And while the new signals are in place, the Pennsylvania Railroad style position light signals still control most locations until the cutover of the new signals. When the cutover occurs, the line between Lock Haven and Harrisburg will be PTC equipped. NS crews had already installed the new signals between CP South Linden and Mecklehatton west of Linden earlier in the year. Shown now is CPSF in Sunbury during the summer of 2016 with the Pennsylvania Railroad position lights still in place. In addition to the new signals for SF and the new interlocking box, NS has also installed a high mass signal off of the X-Reading line which is now operated by the Shimokan Valley Railroad which will replace the Pennsylvania Railroad style pot signal here. At South Miller, this scene has changed forever as the new signals were installed here as well. Four signal bridges will be removed as part of this changeover at Northumberland, Linden, and two at Mecklehatton, so now is the time to get yourself trackside between Mecklehatton, Linden, Northumberland, Sunbury, Herndon, and Millersburg before the summer ends. Controlled sidings will typically have signals at each end, just clear of the switch, as again at CP672, which is located at the north end of Taylor Yard. In automatic block signal territory, such as here on the Norfolk Southern, if a mainline switch is open, the signals facing into that block might be at stop. One possible oddball scenario is that if a train is to enter a siding, the engineer will stop, a member of the train crew will line the switch, which will put the signal at stop, 
and the engineer will then pass the signal at stop and into the siding. Are you confused yet? If so, I caught a similar operation in June of 2015 that might help you understand a little bit better. Just check this out. And that's 2585 North, 931 after stopping, CBS 672. This is Lord of Pass signals playing stop indication, northward direction, main one, or main track to main track, handling our route over.
In pre-radio days, most sidings lacking a station had a dispatcher's phone booth located near each end so trains could contact the dispatcher if necessary. Beginning in the 1960s, these were removed as the radio made them unnecessary. Absolute and or permissive signaling is wired so that all opposing signals to the next siding drop to stop in front of a train. The theory is that an opposing train will thus be held at a siding. And although absolute and or permissive signaling is common in ABS territory, most railroads do not use it as a method of dispatching trains.
An interlocking is a section of track over which movement of trains is governed by signals which are controlled by the interlocking operator. Interlockings are normally located at important junctions, where railroads cross at grade and at the approach to major passenger terminals. Some eastern railroads use a series of interlockings to dispatch trains on multiple track territory. Each and every track entering the interlocking limits will have an absolute signal governing the movement of trains. The operator controlling the signals and switches at an interlocking was usually located in a tower place so that he had good visibility of all the tracks approaching his interlocking. These are the classic towers that are so often modeled and seen on so many railroads today. Remember we talked about that in part one. One of the biggest takeaways from part one is how many railroad junctions are given their often unique names. You learn that sometimes they're mile marker based such as right here at CP672, which is 672 miles from Montreal, Quebec, Canada, and whose mile designation goes all the way back to the original Delaware and Hudson, which was touted as the bridge line to New England and Canada. Other CPs are named after geographic features, and out this away, down in the Philadelphia area, on the main line where CPs are farther apart, they're often named after the town it's located in. Example given is C.P. King, which is King of Prussia, C.P. Norris, which is Norristown, and C.P. Phoenix, which is Phoenixville. Further north in Allentown, there's C.P. Allen and C.P. Ham, which was named for the Hamilton Street overpass. Back in Philly, where CPs are closer together, they are often named after nearby streets, such as CP Gray, which is Gray's Ferry Avenue, CP Penrose, which is Penrose Avenue, or sometimes they're named after nearby landmarks, such as CP Field, which is the Franklin Field, CP Park, which is Fairmont Park, and CP Zoo, also known as the legendary Zoo Interlocking, which is near the Philadelphia Zoo. American Railroad standards called for signals to be placed on the right-hand side of the track. The exception to this was the Chicago and Northwestern, which used left-hand running and signals. This was because the engineer of a steam engine could only see the right-hand side of the track. The same was true for the first-generation hood diesels, as we talked about. For single track or double track signaled for right-hand running only, this was easy enough, but for multiple track, a signal bridge was required. When a signal bridge is used, the signal for each track is 4 feet to 6 feet to the right of the center line of the track that it governs. On double track, where signaling for left-hand running or both tracks in both directions was required, this meant that expensive signal bridges must be built. The Santa Fe had dozens of them in Arizona and New Mexico. Starting in the 1980s, railroads changed their rules to allow field side signals. This was first done on double track with the signal governing the right-hand track to the right and the signal governing the left-hand track to the left, which worked out nice. If there are three or more tracks, then a signal bridge is still used, with each signal placed, as always, to the right of its track. Railroads are now applying the principle of field-side signaling to track with new installations having a signal mast with signal heads facing in both directions. There is no rule regarding whether such signals are on the north or south side of the track. 